We now have 1.6 terawatts of photovoltaic power installed worldwide and last year 400 gigawatts were added globally. So expansion continues to grow. In Germany alone there was a 100% increase from 2022 to 2023. And we see these numbers all around the world. These are super important steps for the energy transition. But of course photovoltaics also have some disadvantages such as the weight of the modules, the need for critical raw materials, dependency on other countries for production, <coughs> China, and the fact that the modules cannot be installed anywhere. The good news is that there is a solution to these problems, organic photovoltaic panels. They are made of carbon, are very sustainable, do not require critical raw materials and can be installed almost anywhere because they are extremely light. Today we will clarify how this type of photovoltaics works, what the advantages and disadvantages are and whether it is a kind of revolution in solar energy or whether a niche product. And with that, welcome to the German Science Guy. I'm Dr. Jakob Botton and in Germany we say Los geht's. Approximately 92% of all solar cells worldwide are silicon solar modules. Silicon is available in large quantities and due to some properties that we will discuss in more detail in a moment, it is perfect for producing electricity from sunlight. Solar cells are very durable and efficient in comparison. They typically achieve an efficiency of between 17 to 22% in application. And if solar cells are installed as tandem solar cells with several layers, for example, an efficiency of approximately 32% can be achieved. However, this type of solar cells also has its disadvantages. Although silicon is the second most common chemical element on Earth, China dominates all stages of the silicon production value chain with a market share of over 80%. This makes Europe and actually the whole world extremely dependent. If trade with China were to collapse, the expansion of PV worldwide would be seriously jeopardized. What is so striking about this is that around 2010 there was actually still a complete PV supply chain, for example here in Germany and Europe. But because demand had fallen slightly in the meantime, production was then discontinued. Now prices from China are so low that it is extremely difficult for Europe to rebuild its own solar industry and it's the same for other countries. Only Norway is currently able to produce competitive silicon due to its low electricity prices. This dependency is of course a clear disadvantage. In addition to silicon, other materials are also needed to make a solar cell. And silver consumption is the most critical of these. The PV industry consumes approximately 1500 tons of silver per year worldwide, which corresponds to just under 6% of the total production in 2020. Another disadvantage is the scrap metal produced by photovoltaic systems. Germany alone already produces 10,000 tons of scrap metal from PV every year. And the International Energy Agency expects this figure to rise to as much as 1 million tons of photovoltaic scrap metal per year alone in Germany by 2030. And by the way, the problem with recycling is not so much the materials themselves, but rather the adhesives. The individual components are simply glued together extremely strongly and it is very difficult to separate them cleanly. This makes recycling difficult. Another point is where can you install solar power? For example, it would be very interesting to install it on company roofs. But that is only a tenth of the suitable commercial roofs in Germany. At least that is an estimate of the German Solar Industry Association. On the one hand, this is due to many bureaucracy hurdles, which also vary from state to state. On the other hand, and this is interesting for the whole world, weight is also a major factor. Often the roof load is insufficient. Depending on the type of module, they weigh between 10 and 25 kilograms. The total weight of such a system can quickly reach 300 kilograms for a single family home and around 500 kilograms for larger buildings. So there are a few challenges, but as you know, I prefer to present you with possible solutions to problems and that's what I'm going to do today. So that's why we are now going to take a closer look at organic solar cells. In terms of the basic principle, organic solar cells are no different from crystalline solar cells. Both convert light into electrical energy through the photovoltaic effect. However, if you look at the exact process, the two methods do differ. Silicon solar cells have two layers. Phosphorus is added to the upper layer, known as the N-layer, which gives the layer freely moving electrons. 
boron is added to the lower layer, the P layer. This creates holes that are positively charged, so to speak. A neutral boundary layer, the PN junction, is created at the point where the two layers meet. The electrons from the N layer now pass through this junction into the holes in the P layer. This charges the edges of the layers. The edge of the N layer is then positive and the edge of the P layer negative. When light waves, so photons, strike the solar cell, this charge distribution is reversed. The electrons are excited by the photons and are released from their bonds. They are attracted by the positively charged N layer and move toward the electrode. A constant movement creates a flow of electrons that can be used. The advantage of silicon is that the electrons can be released from the atom with little energy. And the energy of the photons is sufficient for this. Organic solar cells do not have this advantage. Here the whole process works a little differently. Solar cells have a donor layer and an acceptor layer. These materials are chosen to complete each other well. The donor releases electrons while the acceptor absorbs them. We will come back to the exact materials used in a moment, but when light hits the cell, energy is absorbed, creating bound pairs of electrons and so-called holes. These pairs are called excitons, and the holes represent the absence of electrons, so to speak, and are therefore positively charged. The electrons do not move alone here, but together with the positive charge carriers or holes. At the interface between the donor and the acceptor, the electrons are captured by the acceptor, while the holes remain in the donor. This separates the charges. The charge carriers move to the electrodes by hopping. The anode, usually a transparent conductive layer, collects these holes, while the cathode, a metal layer, collects these electrons. The separation of the two types of charge carriers is crucial for the function of a solar cell, whether organic or inorganic. In organic solar cells, the key to high efficiency, therefore, lies in a design that efficiently separates the very strongly bound excitons. And this happens precisely through the donor and acceptor layer, which in organic solar cells consist of hydrocarbon compounds. These can be conjugated polymers, for example, which are organic materials that usually contain alternating donor and acceptor units in their structure, which is why they are also referred to as DADAD materials. The D and A units, known as monomers, are linked together by various reactions to form polymer chains. They consist of long chains of repeating units. And the key feature of these polymers is that they contain double bonds and single bonds in an alternating pattern. This results in patterns such as the one you see here. This is called a conjugated structure. The special thing about these structures, and especially the double bonds, is that they contain pi electrons. These are less tightly bound and can therefore move easily along the polymer chain. And when electrons move easily through the material, it means that it is electrically conductive or semiconductive. Okay, the other material frequently found in organic solar cells is copper and I have to admit, I don't know how to pronounce this. And I know how to pronounce it in German, but it's this one here. Maybe you can help me how to pronounce this. I have no idea. I tried to find it online. I didn't find it online how to pronounce it correctly. And I don't want to say anything wrong here. So sorry for that. Okay, but what is this? This is a metal complex in which a copper atom is surrounded by a large flat ring molecule. This ring molecule consists of nitrogen atoms and carbon rings. It is resistant to light, heat and many chemicals. Here too there are pi electrons located in the ring structure that can move through the material which is why it can also be used as a semiconductor. Both substances are obtained almost exclusively synthetically. This means that they can be produced in large quantities with controlled properties and production is very easy and very inexpensive. The raw materials, carbon-based plastics, are also very abundant on Earth. So these are pretty great news. For this reason, the layer of organic material must be only a few hundred nanometers thick so that the charges can reach the electrodes quickly enough. This is why the layers, which are 100 times thinner than a human hair, are vapor deposited onto a carrier floor. 
This requirement also leads us directly to a decisive advantage of organic solar cells. Because the layers have to be applied so thinly, the solar cell itself is also super light and flexible and is often produced as a kind of film. In addition, no critical raw materials, heavy metals or other substances are required, eliminating dependency on other countries, which is for me one of the greatest points about this innovation. Production is also very environmentally friendly and the lower weight means less scrap is generated. As already mentioned briefly, many organic solar cells are produced as a kind of film. The largest company that commercially manufactures such a film is even based in Dresden in East Germany. The company is called Heliatech and this film can be easily added almost everywhere and used directly thanks to an integrated connection cable. Such a film element weighs less than 2 kilograms and can be bent up to 50 centimeters. Organic solar cells can be produced not only as film but also as transparent elements. This makes it even possible to attach them to window panes or integrate them into sun protection slats. Although, of course, this naturally has an impact on efficiency, but of course there are applications where this compromise is very justified. The Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems has a project in which organic solar cells are to be used in agriculture. Many plants are grown under foil to protect them from heavy rain, hail or even too much sun. A smart alternative to plastic foil could be translucent organic photovoltaics, which also protect the plants from the weather and generate electricity at the same same time. And there's also a completely different area of application, namely organic solar cells for indoor use. These panels are very efficient at converting artificial light into electricity. They can utilize the light spectrum indoors 10 times better than silicon cells. And by the way, there's even a project by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy in Germany to improve the efficiency of organic solar cells indoors. To this end, a company has already coupled sensor systems and intelligent charging electronics with organic solar cells. In buildings such as hospitals, police stations or research and educational institutions, the lights are on up to 24 hours a day and organic solar cells could be used to power small devices. In addition, integration is more practical here due to the weight and transparency of the cells. Nevertheless, the amount of electricity generated here is relatively low and it is more suitable for small applications such as radio data loggers, remote controls, sensors for temperature, humidity, CO2 or portable electronics. Maybe you already hear it. All in all, this type of solar cell sounds really good and I'm really excited about it. But if you've been subscribing for a while and have activated the bell, then you know what's coming next. If not, do that first, because now comes the big hurdle. This is the part in the video where we look at the problems, at the hurdles of new innovations. And to be honest, every new innovation has some hurdles. And many of you can already guess what this is about. We German usually love it. It's about efficiency, but this time it's not so efficient. So we Germans don't love it because Germans love efficiency. Unfortunately, the efficiency is still slightly lower than that of silicon solar cells. The record here is 15.8% under laboratory conditions. However, 30.2% has already been achieved, at least with artificial light. This is mainly because energy is still lost when the electrons and holes, so the excitons, are separated. In addition, the surface life is also significantly shorter than that of silicon cells because they are attacked by UV light, oxygen and moisture. At the moment, the costs are still high, which is interesting because the production costs are actually lower, but it depends on the scale of production. The solar industry for silicon solar cells is huge, incredibly huge. So the prices have fallen dramatically. But this means that in the long term, organic cells would probably also become significantly cheaper if they are produced on a larger scale. So this is not such a big hurdle, to be honest. So in the end, you can say that the biggest disadvantage or the biggest hurdle right now is still its lower efficiency. But researchers say that the potential has not yet been exhausted and that significantly greater efficiency is possible with more research. So let's come to a conclusion here. Organic solar cells are probably not currently revolutionizing solar energy, but rather occupy a niche market. However, it must also be said that they are a part of solar energy that still has great potentials for development and above all will become even more important in the long term due to the almost infinite availability of raw materials and the sustainability aspect. And since the technological development of organic solar cells is still in its infancy, there is still a lot of room for improvement. 
silicon cells have a 20 to 30 year head start in terms of development, so to speak. But it is clear that at least at present, the two types of solar cells are not in competition with each other, whether both types are simply needed. The production of silicon solar cells will probably always be cheaper in China than in Europe or the US. However, this is still within our control when it comes to organic solar cells. The know-how is already here and can be further expanded and then it should ideally remain here and not be outsourced again, like the last time, which was maybe a big mistake, at least in my opinion. And I also want to say that I think one of the biggest advantages here and why it is so important to put more research in there is that we are cutting dependencies. Because as we can see right now, dependencies are a big problem in our current times. That's my opinion, of course. I'm interested in your opinion, so please tell me what do you think about this innovation in the comments and also what do you think about my point on dependencies? Do you also think we have a big problem here or do you think I'm a little bit overdramatic here? I'm really interested about your opinion and by the way, thank you again for all the comments under the last videos. I'm always so happy to read them. So yeah, thank you very much. And here you find another video. It's also about solar energy, but not solar energy, it's infrared energy. And this also works at night. So it's very interesting technology too. Check it out. And I say Auf Wiedersehen, which means goodbye in German. Thank you for watching.